The Eagleton Institute Center for American Women and Politics presents a public lecture entitled, Can Women Who Change the World Keep Changing It? The program features Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, the 2006 Senator Winona Lippman Chair in Women's Political Leadership. Congresswoman Norton is an eight-term member of Congress representing Washington, D.C., and is co-founder of the National Women's Political Caucus. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Now, I do confess that when I uh, use that term, I, I have yearnings in <laughs> politics. But, but uh, I'm most pleased to be at the uh, extraordinary institution which you head. Uh, and it is one of those colleges, I assure you, uh, that my bill has sent uh, District of Columbia residents too, and no wonder, given the reputation of Rutgers and its assembling university. You know, it's pretty hard to understand what is Rutgers. <laughs> All y'all Rutgers to me. <laughs> and I understand you've been through some kind of reorganization. Hey women, don't, don't worry. Nobody will ever reorganize women out of existence. <laughs> And in the name of, of President McCormick and the uh, wonderful job he's doing at this university, just let me say to the Douglas alumni, I'm going to keep giving to the university. <laughs> Don't get mad. Get even. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about this controversy. I just, I just heard about it when I got up here. I know I'm supposed to be for women wherever they are, but you know me, I was real analytical. I said, okay, now tell me what it is. And, and they kept trying to make me understand. It seemed pretty intangible to me, but you know what? It is, it, love is intangible. <laughs> so keep loving the whole university, and we'll love Douglas too. Uh, I want to thank the president for his very kind introduction. Representative Frank Pallone, my good colleague, your excellent representative, Assemblyman William Payne, Ruth Mandel, Debbie Walsh, co-sponsors of the Winona uh, Lippman Lecture, and of course, students and faculty and ladies and gentlemen who weathered the weather to come out uh, this evening to hear me talk about, you didn't know quite what from that title, soon to know. You know, the first thing I feel like doing is excusing my good colleague Frank Pallone. You know, the notion that Frank Pallone is sitting in here listening to me um, really begs the question. I'm not sure you know all that Frank does in the House of Representatives. You know how well he represents this district. Um, Frank is a quite extraordinary national member of the House of Representatives who has understood that you do duty for your district when you do duty for the House of Representatives. And he has taken on some of the hardest duties uh, in the House of Representatives. We're very lucky that he has taken on the duty he has. Among his duties has been uh, to organize uh, Democratic members to come to the floor of the House to speak in the morning, evening, uh, on subjects of every kind. This is very hard to do. You got to cajole them to come. You sometimes have to get them materials because it, we, we, we do not have encyclopedic knowledge of everything that goes before the House and can be spoken about, but Frank does. So if nobody shows up and it's a democratic time to spend, to speak, do you think Frank is going to let it go to waste? Well, he got to get up there and talk knowledgeably about the subject. Can I say to you how hard that is to do? what kind of knowledge and understanding you have to have, both of your own district, about which he speaks very often on the floor, and of the country at large. Uh, it is, has been a great benefit 
uh, to the members of Congress that the kind of work uh, Frank does, work that means being on top of literally every issue that may come before the House, cajoling members who have a thousand things to do, and being willing to just stand in and speak if necessary. It is difficult for me to convey to you what that means to the Democratic members of the House of Representatives. Just take my word for it. And Frank, you can be excused now. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, Frank came to the reception and I said, my goodness, Frank, I know what it is like. You see, I know. I know what it is like. Members go home. Uh, uh, it is an amazing life. They live two lives in the literal sense of the word and they're not even schizophrenic. <laughs> they have to maintain two homes. Frank has uh, small children and a family. Um, they uh, go home, they must go home to their districts, and then they come right back. Just think of what kind of a life that is and what kind of balance you have to have and what kind of stable person you have to be to handle it all. And then, on top of it, handle all of the members of the House of Representatives who are supposed uh, to come to the floor and make sure they know what to say. Could I ask that you give your own representative a big hand? Just want you to know how lucky you are. Uh, it is, of course, a double pleasure. First, to come once again to the Eagleton Institute's Center for American Women and Politics, and of course, to give this year's Winona Lipman Political Leadership Address. You have honored me as the New Jersey legislature has honored its first African-American uh, woman who has been a senator by simply inviting me in her name. Winona Lipman, PhD, Director of uh, Essex County Freehold Board, State Senator. Uh, she's like Jackie Robinson, not only first, but best. In a country particularly hungry for more perfect political leadership models, Senator Lipman's career was so principled and productive, it outshines the taint that cash and corruption have left on national politics in Washington these days. In a world full of aspiring young women yearning to know whether family, children, and politics is a wonderful stew or a witch's brew, Senator Lipman's career provides wonderful reassurance. Reassur After all, she rose from the PTA to senator and did pioneering work in behalf of those who most needed a senator, forging coalitions uh, in a political environment known to be among the toughest in America. Winona, Lipman's, Winona Lipman is an inspiration well beyond New Jersey's borders. I always appreciate the opportunity to speak about women and politics at the Eagleton Center for American Women and Politics. The center was established just as the women's movement converted from consciousness raising to political action. How fortunate the movement has been to have had the benefit of the, the, the center's path-breaking informed analyses, national surveys, and recommendations for, near, for 35 years. Women in the Senate and the House continue the va to value the Senate's work and to salute its contributions to our own work. I'm sure that is the same of the men who care about women and their needs in our country. My subject, Can Women Who Change the World Keep Changing It, was chosen not only because women have changed the world, 
but to make me use the occasion to think more deeply about where uh, American women stand today and where they may be headed, and especially about the considerable challenges they face today. Now, people do not ordinarily think of American women as revolutionaries, of course, but they have done nothing less than make a successful revolution unique in human history in little more than a generation's time. This evening, I want first to step back from the trees and look at the forest uh, by describing the depth and breadth of the revolution and the reaction it has inevitably engendered. Then I want to get back to the trees and to suggest where some of the challenge, challenges lie, both in issues and in politics. Women's universally secondary status in every society in the world whether primitive or modern, is so striking. We should not be surprised that many would think that the hierarchical gender order is part of the natural order, like the relationship between plants and animals who coexist and benefit each other and the environment in which both exist. How else to explain male superiority in every society throughout human history? Actually, the origins fascinate me. I do not uh, claim to be an anthropologist, but I suspect that the, the uh, uh, origins of the primacy of men, as elusive uh, as they are, would go something like this. In the beginning, uh, men everywhere probably used their physical strength to claim and enforce dominance when physicality was what mattered most for survival. Remember, that has been the case for most centuries that there has been human existence. If they didn't, if physicality wasn't necessary, uh, because uh, you, we were dealing with primitive man, then physicality was necessary because men were always fighting wars. Once male dominance was achieved physically, the rest was not difficult to maintain until now. Of course, um, the progress American women have achieved has been <laughs> aided and abetted by forces larger than our will. Our society has finally achieved control over certain forces that have strictly controlled all societies, almost by necessity, and particularly controlled women, ranging from the consequences of fertility, childbirth, and children, to changes in the economy, and in the remunerative and in the nature of remunerative work no longer dependent on physical strength in our country the most consequential change uh, produced by these forces however uh, is a revolution uh, in women's status that is by now so firm here that it cannot be turned back. Today, women are confronted with the complicated, complicated con consequences of the extraordinary changes they have made. Inevitably, this progress has, transfer, has transformed the lives of millions of Americans and their families. But it also has been inevitably accompanied by its share of confusion and opposition. 
new insights are necessary to help meet new issues and assure that progress continues at the pace women want and require. Why do the changes in women's status propelled by American feminism deserve to be called a revolution? Notwithstanding our impressive modern advanced uh, society and powerhouse economy, the American version of the hierarchical sexual order was virtually untouched until recent decades. As late as the 1960s, help wanted ads were segregated by sex in keeping with pervasive realities in the labor force and accepted by men and by women in this country. Women were intentionally excluded from all the traditionally male occupations and professional schools. Refusal to hire and promote was routine and legal under federal law. Pregnancy uh, could be grounds for dismissal and legitimate grounds at that. And women who were employed and had health insurance were insured for everything except childbirth, for which only token coverage was provided. Abortion was illegal. In little more than a generation, the housewife lifestyle that defined a norm when Betty Friedan wrote the feminine mystique is no more. The average woman, including uh, most married women, uh, is in the labor force today. There is mass approval for work, even for women with young children. Contraception, forbidden to be discussed or supported by government until feminists won this vital victory, is no longer controversial. Abortion, one of the most important and controversial feminist goals has the support of an American majority. Segregated education and sports among the most entrenched of gender uh, traditions have met their match in federal law. Uh, these uh, monumental barriers that had helped solidify women's inferior status have fallen away in our country. It is not over yet, but the feminist revolution grows and spreads as women here and in every corner of the earth pursue their own versions of feminist progress. If progress has been so steady, <laughs> women might well ask, why don't we feel equal yet? <laughs> but of course, to be fair, we say compared to what? To what? Look, for example, at the time it took women to obtain just one, albeit very important goal, the vote, the right to vote. It took the suffrage movement almost 100 years to achieve the vote for women. As seminal as that change was, the single-minded quest for the vote did not bequeath wholesale societal changes similar to those we see today. The reasons are complicated. However, the sustained focus that proved necessary to achieve the vote ceased germinating other gains once that great victory was finally achieved. In contrast, the modern feminist agenda was crowded from the outset and new issues have only multiplied. The work of feminist, feminism goes on with countless women and men consciously or not moving it forward. Beyond our own country, the global spread of feminism and the changes pressed by the transformation of women have become an irreversible force that is changing the world. The task today 
is complicated by the fact that in order for women's status to change the world, to, in order for women's status to change, the world around them must also change from the world of work to society's most basic institution, the family. It is no wonder then that the women's rights revolution, like any revolution worthy of the name, has inspired a counter-revolution in reaction to the gains and changes that are at odds with its world view. However, although America is more conservative than it was as the women's movement arose. Mainstream America is certainly not a part of this counter-revolution. The resistance is the province of the radical right, fueled especially by the religious right. This small but vocal and influential minority believes that women's freedom sets off a domino effect uh, that sweeps away society's most fundamental values. Actually, there is reason uh, to share many of their concerns about American culture, course, the kind of culture parents want to keep their children away from, about family decline, and about the effects on our children. However, women's freedom from ancient restrictions is not the cause of the new problems besetting modern secular societies. Religious conservatives do a disservice to the legitimate issues of family uh, and children that modern societies urgently need to confront when they turn their fire on women and the women's movement, they would be far wiser to count liberated women as among their allies in concern about the consequences of other changes that have occurred simultaneously with the women's movement, particularly the sexual revolution and the growth of fatherless families. Instead, the radical right confuses patriarchy with fatherhood, manliness with male supremacy, it is male bias we're after, not males. Without feminist consciousness, this confusion can overwhelm the separation between sex and sexism. The women's movement is not the first to be threatened by the attempted resurgence of an old order. The difference is in the difficulty that comes from banishing part of the unique, the wonderful relationship between the sexes. It's one of the great wonders of the world. Between banishing part of that relationship and valuing the rest and distinguishing between the two. Should the goal now be to move ahead against the mountain of remaining gender bias or to concentrate on marriage, love, sex, and family? <laughs> have we really come this far only to have our choices revert to these? I think not. The historic change women have made cannot make a U-turn now. The best evidence is that even the most traditional women uh, and families act today on a revised view of women and their potential. The average woman 
may not call herself a feminist, yet the feminist revolution is a potent part of the way she lives her life, goes to school, and goes to work. Feminist aspirations are accepted today in this country as the way the world operates, that some women have not embraced by, by what we of my generation call feminism or do not use the feminist label has had no effect on the pace of feminist change. The new generation has taken up feminist issues, changing the world more than we dared. They have opened many more doors for women, making demands that never crossed our feminist minds. Their remarkable pluralism defies one language, even the explicit language of feminism. Like every revolutionary vanguard, we were smaller uh, and a more cohesive and homogenous, highly conscious group. We therefore needed to speak the same language, the language of feminism, to be understood and to spread the revolution. The new generation gets it, says it in many ways, and moves still more women to feminist ideas and feminist modalities. The proof lies not in what they say, my friends, but in how they act. Today's women think nothing of walking onto factory floors, driving buses, or building things. They believe it is their prerogative to walk into law firms, corporate boardrooms, surgical operating rooms, congressional hearing rooms, and presidential cabinet rooms. They thrill crowds who have never seen women as players of major sports until now. They have raised the quality of recruits in the armed services who then rise through the ranks and serve in posts formally reserved for men only, even deep in the combat zones of Iraq. They do not hesitate to vote their issues as women. They are forging, yes they are, new personal and equal relationships with men. If I am buoyed by the way American society has accepted and absorbed the revolution in women's status, I do not underestimate the danger that ours could be an unfinished revolution. The litany of unfinished business suggests the need for new energy and new thinking and new organizing and new focus and a new sense of priorities. Some of the issues that remain show that women have not fully used their extraordinary collective strength to do what is necessary for them and their families to realize the benefits of their own revolution as it moves forward. Two examples make the point as the average woman has become a working woman, child ha has become an urgently needed and obvious issue for political and social action. As yet, there is nothing approaching a system of early childhood education for working families, despite palpable harm to children, parents, and family life and stability. Compelling scientific evidence suggests that the first years of life are when main development is at its height and learning is optimal. Instead of taking advantage of this unique and, and elusive period in a child's life, parents, especially mothers, scurry simply to find a safe place to leave children while the family is at work. The educational component that might unlock learning potential often is not even a priority considering the basic need simply for facilities and how expensive uh, even uh, the most mundane facilities are. Why have not 
the obvious needs of parents and children for child care become an American priority, leave aside women. The considerable resources that would be necessary is surely not part of the answer. Congress and the President have recently made the education of children their major domestic priority, pouring new funding, uh, almost $10 billion, and substantial energy into the Leave No Child Behind Act. Yet this legislation offers almost nothing concerning the one part of a child's education most in need of attention, focusing entirely on the traditional years of school attendance. Moreover, early childhood education remains excluded from almost all American public education. This omission, as well as the New Education Act, is notable inasmuch as early attention might uniquely advance the statutory objective of No Child Left Behind, of improving the achievement of children as they progress in school because you have caught them when their brains are most supple. One reason, and here lies the responsibility of women themselves, of the women movement, and of women members of the House and Senate. One reason, I submit the major reason that a major education bill focused on children excludes so desperate a need is surely that early childhood education and the task of taking care of children and finding uh, childcare surrogates have been most often left to women. And that is still the case. Notwithstanding the importance of early childhood education to the nation, which has shoved its women out of the door to work, the issue is unlikely to get priority attention unless and until women, in particular, insist. The fact that perhaps the most important issue that remains untouched facing the average working family is where it was at the dawn of feminism speaks to a very large political deficit. Many strategies are necessary to, wake, to make women's political standing and power equal to the task uh, that remains. Political organizing around the issue is, of course, key. However, there is a shortcut to getting more attention to this and other women's issues that will be available in November. Elect many more women who carry a woman's agenda to the Congress of the United States. Now let Frank come back. <laughs> You know, the consciousness raising among some men, like Frank Ballone, has more than worked. Uh, but I'm going to say why I think uh, we need as at least a short-term strategy uh, to get more women in the Congress and in the state legislatures. It is important to press for more women in elective office, not only for its own sake, and we constantly talk about it in old-fashioned American terms of fairness, and not only for the virtuous reasons of fairness and elemental equality. In addition, uh, women and, uh, and women's political leadership is likely to quicken the pace uh, toward equality for the average woman. Women who hold public office are most likely to give attention to women's concerns. Elected women cannot help to transform opportunities for women across the society if there are too few women elected to office to have the desired effect. Measured by objective measures, the House and the Senate and most state legislatures are still male bastions for no reason at all. None. 
Sharing when a woman is added to the Senate or a few more to the House is natural but insufficient. Of course, uh, we are pleased that there are now 14 women in the Senate, up from only two in 1990. Um, there are 70 women in the House, up from 29 in uh, 1990. Uh, and the recognition that bringing women uh, is a proxy for bringing change has even begun to catch on among Republicans, even though the great majority of the women in the House and the Senate uh, overwhelmingly so, about three quarters in each house are Democrats. Don't worry, Republicans are slow learners and they're trying their best to learn this one. <laughs> the number of women in the house more than doubled from 29 to 62 in a, in a single a decade. Uh, the progress uh, will be as significant if the doubling continues at least another uh, decade. This pace, however, can and should be quickened uh, by doing only as well during the, the next 10 years as we did during the last uh, uh, 10. Women would be only 29% of the House of Representatives. Recently, I was alarmed to read that the pace at which women have been elected to state and national legislative offices has actually slowed. Uh, the disproportionate benefit that elected women can have on opportunities for women argues for electing more women to public office as an urgent priority. The fact is that women have done better in opening male-dominated professions, such as medicine and law, previously all but closed to them, than they have in opening their own democratic institutions to women, especially considering that more than half of the people and of the electorate are women, and that the votes of citizens are equal. The present participation of women in leadership roles uh, in the political sphere is not the best that a democratic society can do, nor is it beyond immediate change. Many of the problems that most affect women today are less about equal protection or intentional discrimination, as earlier issues often were, than they are about equal access to resources and about new approaches. Courts are rarely willing or effective in addressing such issues. And male-dominated legislatures often have been slow to grapple with matters that require new resources and new departures. Today's women in our country are sophisticated and discerning and wise about politics. It is time. Uh, to apply this political acumen uh, to their own lagging issues and political representation. It would be unwise to become so intoxicate, intoxicated by the certainty that we have made history, that we become insufficiently attentive to the revolution we are making we cannot afford infatuation with the progress of the last 40 years. We need only be confident that women cannot be turned back. Yet it is one thing to believe that our progress will continue. It is quite another to think that feminist advances are inevitable. There are two possible courses for great movements, history shows. They fire up, bring change, become embers, and die. Or they mature and just keep on growing. Women, my friends, are on course. Thank you very much.